Today we're going to bridge our material from the more theoretical to the more practical. So this may take a little bit of time. Um, if you haven't noticed, this is kind of how this thing goes, that we stir around some ideas, look at some theory, and eventually, hopefully, bring us to a new perspective. That's the idea anyway. So I want to keep talking a little bit about metaphors and beliefs and, and the way that we examine these things is different than how we witness and experience them and how we need to try to bring our experience to a place of understanding. That sounds really abstract. So let's nail something down here. How about pennies? It's funny because uh, I really like pennies. How I feel about a penny really doesn't matter, I know, but I really like them. Um, they're different than the other coins. They're a different color. The president on them is facing a different direction. Um, they have a different weight to them. They're a lot of fun. And yet, I hear all the time these arguments for why we should get rid of pennies. How other countries don't have currency divided quite so low. And how they're a waste of money is something I always hear. I'm always privy to these conversations between people. Who are these people who are talking about pennies? I've seen it on the news and, and hear it in classrooms and stuff, I suppose. That it takes more money to make a penny than what a penny is worth. So naturally, with, with that in mind, you'd think, wow, it takes more than a, a penny to make a penny. Of course we should get rid of them. Now let's examine what a penny is worth. Now, besides nothing, of course, uh, that there's no inherent value to anything besides what we grant it, um, let's really examine what a penny is worth for just a minute. One cent, right? A hundredth of a dollar, etc., etc. But consider that a penny can be used many times. Consider that a penny can be traded around uh, between people over and over again. If I reach into my hand and grab out a handful of pennies, I might find one from, from 2020. I might find one from 2002. I might find one from 1968. Uh, my favorite one that I have, uh, my daughter found when we were moving in a, out of a Victorian house in Michigan, and it was from 1868. And I was excited. I thought this was it. I thought, wow, 1868 penny. I surely this is the jackpot. I'm going to Google how much this is worth and I will never work another day in my life. It's worth $11. Now, $11 is pretty good for a penny because I could go out right now and legally spend it as one cent. Uh, or in theory, I could go sell it to a coin place for $11. They'd probably offer me like four or something like that. Who knows? But it's exciting. It's an exciting find, especially when you're moving out of some old house and to imagine how many hands this thing has been through. My wife used to work at a bank, and once in a while, pennies get left behind at the counter. And something that she was taught is you have to throw them away. If somebody leaves a penny there, you actually have to leave it. You have to throw it in the trash. You can't put it in your register. You can't put it in your pocket because you're working in a bank and, and there's cameras on you. That it actually has to be disposed of. So consider for a second the fact that a penny can last 160 years or it could be thrown away at a bank the very day you get it. So there's this strange sort of disparity there that a penny is worth a cent, yes, but it's worth a cent over and over and over again for as long as it's in circulation. Could be three days, could be 30 years. It depends on the individual penny and its own luck. The reason I'm making this comparison is because it's a symbol. It's universal for me on, on some weird little level. It's personal. But regardless, it is something that sparks conversation and that can really lead us down this rabbit hole of value and metaphor because it is clearly like everything else a metaphorical value now, everybody likes to point to the time that we went off the gold standard and franklin De delano roosevelt's presidency as the time that money became purely imaginary before then it was based on the value of gold 
And again, the value of gold is essentially um, imaginary. We, we choose values. And you don't have to have a physical penny in order to have the value of it. We could discard with pennies altogether and uh, just trade them around in computers. And nothing very much in our society would change uh, beyond the coming scarcity of pennies, which would make me kind of sad. I like to pick them up and think I get good luck for the day. It's a little superstition. So we have a representation of a penny in our mind, of what it's worth, of what it does for us. And again, it is both universal and personal and completely imaginary. It's a completely borrowed definition. It has no inherent value beyond what we place on it. Our brains are really good at this. Our brains make categorical assumptions about everything we come into contact with. Now, like I was saying last time, that we see uh, somebody who's a little different than us and we categorize them. Uh, some people, maybe you can categorize them into cat or dog people. You can categorize them, categorize them into their profession, their educational level, their race, their gender, their uh, generation. And all these categories do is break down into these little divisions that help us believe that we're understanding them. Our brains want to understand everything through categorization. In fact, I would propose to you that in many, many ways, thinking is categorical thinking. That in breaking things down, in uh, simplifying into groupings, that is the way we understand the world around us. And those assumptions of value within those groups are just as effortless and simple as that of the penny. The first thing we do when we dis discover something new, a new star, a new planet, a new germ, a new animal, is we name it. And in naming it, we take away the mystery of not understanding it. And naming it, it becomes the accepted part of our world. Now, we see this all the time with, with viruses or, or germs or uh, aforementioned you know, asteroids or other celestial bodies. But we can see this in much larger things and in more stirring ways, I believe. For example, gorillas. Uh, gorillas were considered by um, you know, most uh, of the Western world as imaginary, as mythical, until the 1880s. And uh, my, my favorite example is panda bears. Panda bears were verified to exist to Western science in the 1930s. Imagine that, the 1930s. We were uh, halfway between World War I and World War II when uh, it was accepted that, that panda bears were a thing in our United States popular culture. What a, what a stirring discovery. What an amazing looking animal. And completely not mysterious because they have a name and, and we study them and we, we put them in a category with other like animals, which isn't so much the bear, by the way. And we uh, substitute all of this stuff for an actual deeper understanding. And of course, there are some people who are more expert about them than others. But all the mystery is taken away through this categorization. By going to school, by, by learning things, we delve into these categories. And once you start understanding these different categories, categories of history, categories of geography, geography categories of uh, different epochs and uh, epochs, then all of a sudden, you don't have to have a deep experiential knowledge because you remember this sort of symbolic knowledge, this ballparking of events, this ballparking of, of characters, and it gives you just enough, just enough to function uh, more or less in the daily world. So in some groups, you might look like an idiot. In some groups, you might look like a genius. But ultimately, it is through this breaking down into categories that you're able to gain 
some sort of a conversant ability. And this is partially because our, our language is, is built, again, around this categorization, around breaking things down, around ultimately not fully understanding, ultimately around a story. We ignore reality and substitute a story for its place. A name is a type of story. The value of a penny is a type of story. So another thing that's a type of story is our country as a whole. I've been in, in 47 states in the country. I've driven through 47 of them. I'm missing Maine, Alaska, and Hawaii, and I would love to go to those states. And there is a, a vast differences between any two states. You know, um, Nevada and Tennessee, say, are completely different. Um, maybe Alabama and Georgia are a little more alike than Nevada and Tennessee. Um, Rhode Island and, uh, and uh, Massachusetts are much more alike than, you know, um, Washington and, and Texas. But ultimately, go all around Texas sometime and... Where is Texas? At what point are you experiencing the true Texas? Is it in the desert? Is it in the prairie? Is it in the forests in the east? Is it at the Alamo? Is it in the in Nagadocha somewhere? Fort Worth? Amarillo? The, 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 it's so different within some place like Texas. California is so different. Joshua Tree is so completely different than, than Morro Bay. And where is this ultimate California? Okay, maybe this feels a little weird and a little abstract. Where is the United States? Where is California? Uh, consider this. I take a lot of pride in my college, the college where I work. I'm proud of it. I think it's a, a, a beautiful place. I think it's a wonderful thing. But... Let me ask you for a second. What is the college? Is the college the, the curriculum, the professors, the students, the buildings, the land that it's on? We've gotten this renewed sort of flexibility of what the college is through this um, remote learning uh, pandemic shift that we had. And every college has sort of faced this. Every school has faced it. But it brings back this idea that ultimately the idea of college, of my college or your college or uh, your high school, of your workplace, of your company, is just an idea. It is just an abstraction. It's a coin in your head. My college is nothing more than that penny. And it's nice shorthand to understand it as this one sort of wrapped up thing. It has a vision statement. It has um, a, a goals. It has learning outcomes. It produces alumni. It uh, does all sorts of um, wonderful things. But ultimately, it is a very abstract concept. There is no one place where you can hold some sort of charter that represents the entire college. You can't pick up this like mysterious box that's buried underneath the president's office and move it to a new office and now have that be the center of the college. Ooh, that would be cool though, huh? There is no United States beyond, uh, you know, borders and it's full of people and there's laws. Sure, but... Where is this one and true sort of United States? It's sort of like how the Holy Roman Empire uh, eventually wasn't Roman at all, or holy, or an empire, but was the same sort of idea that's moved along from one place to another. There was some fantasy novel that came out um, in the 90s, and it had this really neat sort of thought um, puzzle in it. And I don't, I, forgive me, I don't remember. Um, let's, it's probably Terry Pratchett, let's be honest here, who wrote this. And this dwarf is talking about his axe. And the dwarf says, this is my grandfather's axe. My father had to replace the handle, and I had to replace the head. 
but nevertheless, this is my grandfather's axe. If you have your grandfather's axe and it has all been replaced, is it the same axe? If you have a boat and board by board you have had to repair every single part of that boat, is it still the same boat? Do we borrow these characteristics and move it along? And as we discussed last time, people do this with our cells. That we reproduce a copy of ourselves through our uh, selves through our cells and we consider ourselves the same person. We don't see that our selfhood has changed. We're performing the same functions. We have the same bonds that we had. We use the same words. We have the same memories. But we are an entirely different structure. So with this in mind, just think about, you know, nationalism. Think about this idea of uh, taking pride in not just a college, but an entire country and in a history of that country and uh, in an identification with that country and putting that in its interests above some other country in their interests because it's harder to find the humanity in an other, because it's harder to find the humanity in something that lies outside of the idea that you're already comfortable with. And this nationalism substitutes as an, uh, for understanding of what it's really masking. The, the, the collective, the, the unity, the um, laws, the place, all of these different ideas that aren't in any way ultimately very separate from anywhere else. But it creates and defines this space and, 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 and masks uh, all of it. You know, and I'm telling you, this is a, a big country with a lot of people, with lots of different goals and lots of different ideas, but we try so desperately to unify them into one sort of direction, one sort of like um, desire, one sort of dream. Why? Well, for one thing, nationalism really helps with addressing local problems, but it also doesn't help in uh, the much broader, like, worldly problems. Uh, I think we've mentioned before that there are more slaves in the world now than there ever were before in history. And our nationalism uh, holds this country back, this mighty, powerful, and rich country, from doing a damn thing about it. For the price of the 2008 bailout of the banks, we could have freed every single slave in the world, which wouldn't have necessarily um, solved their problems, but it would have solved one of their major problems, their servitude, their slaverihood. And from there, you know, with maybe some other programs, we could have fixed more. But our nationalism gives us this, this direction that is justified in selfishness. And you can break this down to states, to communities, to cities, where you can address your local problems really well. Within my family, I can address the, the problems that we have. Maybe we have a transportation problem. Maybe we have a, a, a food problem, and we need to, 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 to do something about that. There's different deficiencies that we might come up with in a week. Somebody needs pants. Somebody grew out of their shoes. And you can address and fix these problems. But it narrows me from caring about and thinking about the problems of other families, of other people, of people on the other side of the world for the price of a pair of shoes for one of my kids. In some parts of the world, you could buy the the, uh, freedom of seven slaves. In some parts of the world, a slave costs as little as $10. And again, buying their freedom uh, does not remove them from the conditions that made slaveryhood possible. And this is a much more complicated problem than throwing money around. But you see, you get my drift. That these definitions, of these stories that we take on, that, that categorize things, set up divisions that separate us more, more fully. What this has to do with education and learning is that our brains are so bent towards it and it can become the basis for a curriculum, the basis for an education system. 
the ability to, to, to break things down and to show your place in the continuum as natural, as necessary, as uh, important, that you stay within that system. That you don't try to break out of that system, that you don't try to change that system, because the way it's taught to you is by the logic of that categorization, the logic of these symbols, the logic of these stories, and it can place you really firmly in this one sort of category that shows that there is some reward by following this logic, by following the way this is built, and that you will be rewarded. And maybe it's not the reward you were asking for. Maybe it was. Now, okay. Belief is a really weird thing. There are facts and there are beliefs, and, and it's amazing these days that we have to get into things as intricate as, you know, is the world flat all over again, and is the climate changing, when uh, some mo most of these things are, are facts. Um, how it's changing, there are theories. How you know, evolution takes place is a, a workable, functional theory that does not mean, it is not verified, in fact, that evolution is a thing. And yet, you know, we have different people fighting for the logic of that. But belief, I mean, just think about this. Like, wars are fought over beliefs. Giant political divisions are fought over beliefs. And imagine how much has been fought about about the transubstantiation. Um, think back to, to pre-Renaissance, um, pre-Reformation, when um, there was uh, this one sort of dominant church that we now call the Catholic Church, and, and then there was Lutheranism and Calvinism, and uh, that there were giant divisions over whether or not it was uh, literal that taking the Eucharist, it physically turns into to Jesus's body and to Jesus's blood. And I, you know, I don't want to get into your beliefs on this, but literal? Have you chewed this piece of bread? Do you think that the Son of God was had a loafy texture to him? Or are we all playing Emperor's New Clothes and pretending like it turned into a raw, meaty thing in our mouths? Or are we fighting about that it literally, figuratively turns into it? Because that's a thing. It can literally, figuratively do things, and we can fight about that. I and mean, just think about that. that. That's worth fighting about. You can't let somebody else just have their belief if they're being more like literally literal instead of literally figurative. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm, I could spin out on this. It, it trips me out. Uh, but look at it this way. Some of the biggest fools I've ever met have, have been uh, very accomplished in, in their field. Some of the biggest fools I've ever met um, have been uh, PhDs. And it's nothing against the PhD. It's just that I've met a lot of people who have PhDs because I work in colleges. And some of them are complete fools. Do not mistake a degree for practical, applicable knowledge. Do not mistake the accomplishment of a degree for intelligence. Not the kind of intelligence that, that you and I are after anyway. A functional, elegant, um, dexteritous type of intelligence that helps us see the world more openly and, and purely. I'm assuming that's what you're after if you've stayed with this for 11 lectures. But here's where we get a little bit more uh, down to earth, down to physics, down to, or I guess, to biology about this, that your brain doesn't know the difference between a story and reality. This is one reason why we're so teachable, because story and reality have a massive uh, congruence to them in the way that our brain reacts to the world. You have inside your brain these different modules and they grew up over different times, different periods of evolution. One such module inside your brain that is hyper important is the amygdala. And the amygdala is this little guy in your brain who basically 
uh, he regulates what's going on in relationship to fear. And the amygdala routes chemicals and routes activity and routes energy due to what's going on around you. The amygdala is the reason that you have this fight or flight or freeze response to situations, for example. But the amygdala evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. And just over the last hundred years, things have gotten a whole lot less scary out there. But for those first many hundreds of thousands of years, if there was a rustle in the bushes next to you, it was going down, man. You had to deal. Something was happening here. Whatever it was rustling in that bushes, can you eat it? It Can it eat you? Those are the first gatekeepers that your amygdala goes through. And your amygdala is connected to your hippocampus. And your hippocampus is this little guy in your brain that for whatever reason neuroscientists always point out is seahorse-shaped. Who cares? But okay, it's a little tiny seahorse in your brain that has a lot to do with storing memories. And the amygdala will choke that hippocampus out when it is scared. Why does it do this? Because it has to reroute things to other reserves. So, But here's the thing. Your amygdala does not the, know the difference between workplace stress and being chased by a tiger. It sees no difference here. It does the same things. It creates the same hormones, the same sorts of, uh, you know, adrenaline, endorphins, um, cortisol that it would create if you're in physical danger. The story of stress, the story of the pressure that you feel in the world, the story of the, the stress that you feel as a due date is coming up on an assignment that you haven't started, feels just like you are in impending danger, impending low-key danger for a long time. This interferes with your memory. This interferes with your learning. This interferes with your quality of life. If you are stressed out about money, this amygdala will take a, away energy from many of your emotions that don't deal with stress. So you're stressed out about money and something magical happens with your new baby and they say your name for the first time or they take their first step and you don't feel what you feel like you should because the world is being grayed out to you because you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from or you don't know how you're going to make rent or you don't know how you're going to pay for food for that little guy. The amygdala will stand in between the world and you. Now, don't get me wrong, it has great application, but stress is something that uh, has very little um, good application these days. Now, like, there's a certain amount of stress that's healthy. There's a certain amount of stress that that uh, actually you know makes your cells more robust and and makes your learning a little bit more effective because you get a nice sort of chemical rush going. But that's not the kind of stress that we talk about when we talk about depression, anxiety, and uh, chronic stress from from work and and from school. The kind of stress that you complain about, the kind of stress that that really bothers you, is is what we are generally talking about when we talk about problems with the amygdala. And the amygdala will prep your mind to create a story. You remember that that uh, left side of your brain that narrates everything that's going on, that left side of the brain that creates an instant rationalization to any sort of input that instantly tells you why you made a certain decision or instantly tells you uh, what somebody is thinking about you. The amygdala triggers that guy so hard. So if you're at work and there's a couple people over them, there to themselves and they, they, they're whispering. Your amygdala, if you're feeling a lot of stress, will talk to that guy and that guy will go, they're stressed. Those people are talking. Guess what? They're talking about you. That's what's going on here. People are laughing. Oh, they're laughing at you. That's what's going on here. Because that narrator responds to the stress so well. If you get really embarrassed, something embarrassing happens, um, that little narrator very often will fall back on 
let's not worry about this situation. Let's think about something that, um, that you're good at. So you, you get humiliated at work and you go, well, that's fine, but they're not so smart about this and that. And you'll start instantly getting these sort of justifications that protect your selfhood too. The problem is that none of those stories are um, significant and none of those stories are helpful. So whether your narrator is defending you to yourself, defending the ways in which you are valuable to make you feel like your selfhood is not being threatened or is attacking your selfhood in responding to what's going on around you mixed with stress, neither one is helpful at all. The amygdala creates a fear response and it knows no difference from danger, stress, and the outside world. And it will talk to your narrator and tell you that all sorts of dangerous things are happening when they're not. You have anxiety or depression, this gets even worse. You'll be driving down the street and you'll feel like you're basically having a premonition that you're going to be in a car accident. You'll be telling yourself that you're basically having a premonition that you're going to lose your job. This is a gut feeling that you have to go with. This is just nonsense. This is just storytelling in your mind. This is a, what I always call spinning out. Because your, your amygdala and your uh, left side narrator will start spinning yarns, spinning stories to tell you. One minute, it's doom and gloom. The next minute, it's how great and underappreciated you are. And it swings back and forth on this pendulum depending on what kind of day you're having, depending on how you're responding to this kind of stress. And it feels so out of control. Do you realize that there are psychologists out there like B.F. Skinner, for example, who believes that you have no free will, believes only in what is observable. And he has great work about observing people in experimental situations because his work really focuses on what can be seen and what can be seen only and from what he can see. It looks like people cannot choose how they respond to things, how they make decisions, that you have nothing but a physiological reaction to inputs, that something happens out in the world and you just do it and you're a passenger here and that your brain is just telling you that you're making decisions because all you're doing is reacting to your programming that's deep inside that Cro-Magnon mind that you're carrying around. Now, I don't agree with Skinner. I think that you do have free will, that you do have something beyond your physiological abilities. But is that just my narrator telling me this? No. There are ways that you can turn off the amygdala's response. There are ways you can reassure the amygdala, don't worry, we're safe, stop this flow, give me back my hippocampus, let's do something here. People who are well-adjusted to the world, such as it is, this uh, unnatural world that we live in, are able to do this. Now, there's a couple tools that I can share with you that help with this. One we've talked about already, this is mindfulness. Mindfulness helps you concentrate, it helps you focus, it helps you turn off the thoughts that instantly arise in your mind. It helps you see it as thinking. It helps you separate yourself from your thinking. It helps you see that this internal narrator, this thinking, is not you. And it is not always true. And that lets you sidestep a whole lot of problems that arise in the busy mind. It helps you reassure your amygdala that you can chill out, there's not a danger here. We need to slow down and we need to react rationally. This is the basis of mindfulness and it's been around for thousands of years and this isn't taught in school. Exercise is the other thing because exercise is a way of processing stress. It's a way of processing all of the effects that the amygdala throws at you. Going for a brisk walk, going for a run, um, jumping jacks, jump rope, um, all of these things that uh, are an adaptation in our normal life of what people used to have to do 
running around a lot. It used to be that the person had to walk, and this is stone ages now, a person had to walk an average of five to 10 miles to get a meal. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Five or 10 feet will do it for most of us. And for most of us, uh, that meal is going to be much more densely caloric than our caveman cells would have had, but also much more dense in nutrition too than our caveman self would have had, which is uh, leads to some good brain health. Um, incidentally, in a little parenthesis here, one reason that people um, in meditative states or fasting states or um, other sort of uh, spiritual states that, that capitalize on those uh, types of things would be able to reach altered consciousness, consciousness much more quickly is because they were so deprived of, of vitamins and minerals. Their brain was ready to, um, to give up just a little bit and shut off some of those filters and let you experience some of those altered states a little more quickly than today in these well-nourished minds of ours. So we really have to very intentionally address what's going on in our head. If you are in a pandemic lockdown, chances are you're getting less exercise, you're getting less novelty, and you're getting less concentration than you have ever before in your life. And my uh, non-legally binding prescription for you is to practice mindfulness and to get exercise. And we're going to get into some more of those nitty-gritty practical things on our uh, next talk.